Good morning, church family. Happy Memorial Day weekend to you. This weekend, as we celebrate Memorial Day, we remember and we honor those who have died in the armed forces. We remember the battles and the wars that many went through and died in even to really preserve our physical freedom. But what we're going to do today is we're going to look at yet another battle, a battle that we are all in, and we'll be looking at one who died to gain our everlasting freedom. So as we do that, as we prepare for that, would you join me in prayer as we prepare to get into this next section of the Lord's Prayer? Pray with me. Father, I ask that we would each reach hold of this everlasting freedom, that we would experience it, that we would find it, that as we live this Lord's Prayer, as we pray this prayer, Jesus, that you taught us to pray, that we would find freedom from every fracture every situation in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, this pandemic that we have been in has exposed some deep level things in our culture, some things that have remained hidden for quite some time and have now been exposed. For example, domestic abuse during this pandemic has spiked. Alcohol sales have been just off the charts. Gun and ammunition sales have been off the charts as well. Pornography sales have also substantially increased. Anger, anxiety, and depression issues have all escalated. But the root problem here isn't the abuse. It's not the alcohol. It's not the addiction. It's not the anger-based issues that we see. The real problem are some deeper level fractures that we have in our souls some deeper level fractures that God really wants to heal. And today, as we walk through the Lord's Prayer yet again, we're going to finish the Lord's Prayer today. We're going to be looking at these fractures. So, for example, when Jesus says, pray this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, He's connecting us to a Father, and He is allowing us to heal a deep fracture that you and I have as we don't connect with God and as we don't connect with God as a loving Father. And then he says, hallowed be your name. Oh, I worship your name. I value your name is what we're doing when we pray that. And, and, and the deep level fracture that we have is that so many of us worship and value something above God. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The deeper fracture is that so many of us are, are, are really pursuing our will and our kingdom and not God's will and not God's kingdom. Give us this day our daily bread. So many of us, a deep level fracture is our self-sufficiency, and we just do not depend on God. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. A deep level fracture is that we remain in bitterness, and we are unforgiving, and we can't move past that. And then today, we're looking at this portion, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And, and, and here's what we're doing. We're saying, God, the deeper level fracture in our lives is our tendency to both give in as well as to give up. Keep me, Lord God, from giving in and giving up. And let me explain that a bit further. Giving in is when you and I say, you know what, I know, I, I know what God says about this, but I'm just tired. I know what God says about this, but I'm just bored, or I'm just lonely, or I deserve this, or just one time won't hurt, or what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Whatever our excuse might be, giving in is where we justify it, we move toward that, and we take the bait, and we end up trapped. But it's not just about giving in. This deep level fracture is also about giving up. And, and, and giving up is where you and I say, you know what, I know that with God all things are possible, but I'm just tired. I know that with God all things are possible, but I'm done. I've had it. I'm out of this relationship. I'm out of this marriage. I'm out of this situation. I'm tired of waiting on God. I, he hasn't come through for me the way that I've wanted, and so I give up. So really, the deeper level fracture is the character issues in us that lead us to be so quick to both give in and to give up. God says, I want to heal that fracture in your lives. And it begins by praying this prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so what does that mean? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It means this, that the word temptation is a big word. 
It's a, it's a really big word in Scripture, and, and it can't quite be contained in the English language. It's so much bigger. It both means giving in to things like temptations, as we know, but it also can be translated in the Bible as trials and prolonged times of suffering and giving in because we become so discouraged and overburdened by the trial, and so it means giving up or giving in. Uh, what, this, what this verse doesn't mean is this. Well, it doesn't mean that we can somehow pray to avoid temptation. Uh, and it doesn't mean that if we don't pray, God's going to somehow lead us into temptation. Uh, here's the best way to explain what this means. And the New Living Translation puts it this way in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Uh, and here's really the best encapsulated uh, sentence for what this means. And let me read it to you and do not let us yield to temptation. Do not let us either give in or give up, but rescue us from the evil one. That's what we're praying for. God, keep me from giving in, keep me from giving up. So why do I need this prayer? Well, why do you and I need to pray this on a regular daily basis? Why is it that we need this? Let me give you four reasons. The four reasons why we need this is firstly, it's this, my battle is lifelong. I need this because I, I am in a lifelong battle that isn't going to go away. And because I'm in a battle, I'm in danger. I'm vulnerable. I need protection at any moment. You and I know this. We can give in or give up. What We are just one decision away from giving in or giving up. And God wants us to know this. God wants us to recognize our frailty and ask for his help and say, God, keep me from giving in, keep me from giving up, keep me from yielding. You see, this is not a hero's prayer. This is not a prayer where we're saying, God, bring it on. Bring on the tempter, bring on the temptation. I can handle them both. Absolutely not. In fact, what we're saying is, God, I can't handle it. I need for you to help me as I face into this situation that I'm facing, because without you, I'm going to give in. Without you, I am going to give up. So why, why do we yield so easily? Uh, I think one reason why is simply because many of us think that we can be above temptation. Uh, I think there is this lie out there that says that if I'm just spiritual enough, God won't uh, allow me to be tempted, that if I'm just spiritual enough, uh, I'm going to be above trials and tribulations and above the suffering that might come. If I just, if I just cross all my T's spiritually and dot all my I's, God will somehow keep me from ever being tempted and ever being in those places. But that's absolutely not true. Back in 2019, we saw yet another group of high-profile pastors that gave in to moral temptation and basically ended their ministries. And it ended, it ended not only their ministries, but much of the work that they had done. And it's just devastating to see these things happen. It's just heartbreaking to see these things happen. But you can, you can take this to the bank, 2AT, you can go back and every pastor who wound up failing morally, if you go back and read what they wrote, or if you actually listen to their sermons where they talked about things like this, most of them came to believe that somehow they were above it and somehow it wasn't going to hit them. Here's what Jesus is saying, you're not above it. Uh, temptations are inevitable, he tells us in Matthew 18. These things will happen <laughs> trust in me. Trust in my power that you might resist and not give in and not give up. Listen to what James tells us in the epistle of James. He says, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And so I just want to make two points with this verse. And the first point is the word when. And notice the word when. James is writing and he's talking about temptations, both, both temptations to give in and temptations to give up. Read James chapter 1. Uh, I'm going to cover it in depth over the next few weeks on Wednesdays. But, but what, what he's doing is he is saying, when tempted, he doesn't say if tempted or, or some people will be tempted. He says when you were tempted. He is saying, take this to the bank. You will go through times of temptation. You will experience these times of temptation. And the second thing that he says is right here. When you're tempted, no one should say God is doing it. 
For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does God tempt anyone. In other words, James is reminding us when we're tempted, because we all will be, God's not behind it. Well, who's behind it? Well, Jesus lets us know in the prayer, pray this way, he says, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And so this is a prayer we all need to pray because our battle is lifelong. And secondly, move on with me, my enemy is unseen. Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. The evil one, the Bible calls him out by many names, Lucifer, the devil, Satan. We, we, we get his name throughout Scripture. About nine years ago, there was a survey of American Christians, and the survey was basically asking a series of questions. And one of the questions was, do you believe that there is a personal devil, that, that there is a personal entity called Satan? And, and interestingly enough, 55% of Americans, American Christians said, no, I don't. Uh, and here's how that broke down. 45% of those who said that they were born again did not believe that there is a devil, and 68% of Roman Catholics did not believe that there is a devil. That, that was basically the survey that was done. But here's what the Bible tells us. And you know, in, in spite of popular opinion, here's what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 12. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so Paul here in Ephesians is really laying out for us that we need to understand who our enemy is. Uh, and the first thing he says is we're all in a battle. We've got to put on armor. And, and, and we're in a battle against an enemy, he says, that we cannot see. And, and, and what happens when we don't understand this we end up turning on each other. And let me explain. Years ago, Deanna and I, this, is, this was 1999, De Deanna and I were, were struggling in our marriage. And, and we were having a hard time really trying to make it through some deep impasses that we had arrived at, particularly in, in areas of parenting. And so we wound up going to a marriage conference. And at this marriage conference, the first thing they did right off the bat is they said, okay, married couples turn and face each other. And so we turned our chair and we kind of faced each other. And they said, repeat this to each other and speak these words to each other. You are not my enemy. And I, I remember just having to choke out the words, looking at Deanna and saying to her, you are not my enemy. And that's when I realized I had come to believe the lie. And the lie I'd come to believe is that my battle was against my wife. My battle was against her. My battle was against her specifically at home. She was my enemy when, in fact, I was ignoring everything that Paul tells us here in Ephesians. And I was ignoring that, yes, we have an enemy, and that enemy is unseen. Uh, he says this, this is an unseen enemy in places that we cannot go to in the heavenly realms and places that we cannot see. You might be in conflict today. You might be in conflict with a spouse, with a neighbor, with a coworker, and you're in a heated conflict. And this conflict is causing you to, to lose much sleep as well as it's, it's taxing on you emotionally. Know this, that person with whom you have a conflict is not your enemy. That person is a part of what Paul says is flesh and blood, and our enemy is not flesh and blood. And if we don't understand this, we're going to end up blaming another person, and we're going to end up not only blaming, but demonizing another human being. I mean, this is exactly why Jesus says, love your enemies. Those people that you want to consider as enemies, love them and pray for them. Why? Because they can be won over. And this is why we love our enemies and pray for them, because they, they, they don't have to be pivoted against us. And God wants to win them over, and God loves them. But we have an enemy that sealed his fate, that cannot be won over, and that wants to bring us down. And Jesus is saying, recognize that. When he says, lead us not into temptation, don't let us yield from temptation, but rescue us from the enemy. You know, this is why Jesus tells 
that we have to ultimately consider uh, everyone in this category as flesh and blood, as people that can be won over. When we don't get this, we end up fighting the wrong battle. There's a difference between wild donkeys and wild horses. Both wild donkeys and wild horses are attacked by wolves. And it's interesting how they, e how they each react. So when wild horses are attacked by wolves, what they do is they end up putting their heads together and they put their hind ends outside and they end up just kicking the blazes out of the wolves. But when wild donkeys are attacked, what they end up doing is they put their hind ends together and they end up kicking the blazes out of each other. You see, here's what happens when you don't realize that our enemy is unseen. You end up kicking the blazes out of another person who is flesh and blood. And you end up in a battle that you should not be in. And you end up keeping, perhaps even by demonizing them, God from working in their life and them being won over. You see, here's what we're being told. We have an enemy and he is unseen. And not only that, but go back here to this first sentence, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Look at the word schemes. It's the Greek word methodia. We get our word method. In other words, we have an enemy and he has schemes. He has a method. He has a design. He has a strategy as he studies us to bring us down. And so we have to pray. Do not let us yield to temptation. Don't let us give in or give up because both of them are traps of this enemy that is unseen. So that takes us to step three. And, and, and here's the third thing. Here's the third reason why we need to pray this prayer. It's this, my weaknesses are exploited. So my battle is lifelong, my enemy is unseen, and my every weakness is exploited. Now listen to what Peter says when he talks about the devil and our weaknesses and this exploitation, and he paints this picture for us of lions attacking prey. Let, listen to what he says here in 1 Peter 5, verse 8. He says this, be self-controlled and alert. Why? Because your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, here's what lions do. They end up stalking their prey. They look for their prey. They end up picking out the weak. They end up picking out the sick and those who are alone. Take a look at this video as you see exactly how lions go about hunting their prey. Zebras learn to keep their distance, but one zebra is about to violate the first rule of the safari. Always stay with the group. The lion will go for the typical death blow, crushing the windpipe. So lions attack the weak, the sick, and the alone. And you saw it there in the video, that, that awful attack. And, uh, and that's what Peter is saying happens to us. He says, we have an enemy who does that to us, who stalks us. Now, if you have a stalker, don't you want to know about that stalker? You know, don't you want to know what he can do, what he will do? I mean, I think, I think you certainly do, because, because this is what Peter is telling us. We have a stalker. We have one who is studying our every weakness and who is attacking our areas of weakness. And, and he attacks the weak, the sick, and the alone. And let me give you three. I just want to mention three things that make us spiritually weak, spiritually sick, and spiritually alone. And the first one is this, my lack of forgiveness. So if you want to be lion's prey, the first thing is, you know, don't forgive and don't, and don't actually extend grace. And here's what we're told. I know we looked at this last week with forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, but we've got to revisit it again because our lack of forgiveness is a trap set by the enemy. Listen to what Paul tells us again as we look at what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. He says, in your anger, do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Now, notice what Paul is saying. He's saying anger itself, the initial impulse of anger itself is not a sin. The sin is where we wind up holding that initial impulse of anger. So how long can I hold it? Well, probably a matter of seconds to minutes. Don't let it go into hours because here's what he says. Once you let the sun go down on your anger, something changes inside of you. Uh, And here's how we know. The New Testament is written in Greek, and so these words are in Greek, and I need to tell you what the words mean. In your anger, orgizo, means passionate anger. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. It's one one word in English, but this word in Greek is parorgizmos, which means rage. It, It will become rage. And once it turns to rage, look what happens. Do not give the devil a foothold. Now you have given in to the trap. And now the devil starts having you trapped and uh, and ensnared because because this is what he does. And and actually giving in to anger and and, and giving up and letting go to rage is ultimately giving in to this temptation. And it leaves us weak. It leaves us sick. It leaves us alone. Now, here's what we're told, again, by Paul, but this time in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11. Here's what he says about forgiveness. He says this, Forgive in order that Satan might not outwit us. In other words, if we don't forgive, he's outwitted us. He's ensnared us. We, We have given him a foothold in our life, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So the three things that will leave us spiritually sick, weak, and alone. The first one is this, lack of forgiveness. The second one is lack of surrender. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul talks about weapons of warfare, and here's what he says. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And here's what Paul is saying. Have you ever said things like, I know what the Bible says. I know what God says about this, but here's what I really think. You know, have you ever said, I know what the Bible says about God. I know what the Bible says about life. I know what the Bible says about sex. I know what the Bible says about heaven, about hell. But here's what I really think. Uh, And and if you have done that, then what you have done is you have set up a stronghold and you have set up an argument in your mind. And you have built these like like a a castle, if you will. You have built these like a, a construction that sets itself up against the truth of God. You know, personally, I have done this. Going back 30 years ago in my life, or almost 30 years ago, I remember clearly saying, I don't believe the Bible. I actually wrote this down in my journal. I refuse to accept God's word as my authority in life. And so instead of coming under Scripture and God's authority, I remember coming over it and picking it apart. And that's where I was at that point. I wasn't, I had set up in my own mind This argument I had set up in my own mind, a stronghold, and because of that, I was weak spiritually. Uh, I was was fair game for the enemy, and and I was opposing myself to the truth of God. I, I didn't believe the Bible was God's word until 1992 when I had this encounter where God humbled me, and I cried out on Interstate 20, driving back from Dallas one day, back to Marshall, Texas, where Deanna and I were living, and I cried out, God, I'm such a sinner. And for the first time in my life, I recognized my sin, I confessed my sin, and I trusted my life fully to Jesus Christ, handing it all over to Him, and and coming under His authority. And I remember taking the Bible and saying, and even physically doing this, saying, God, instead of coming over it, I choose to come under it. Lord God, demolish any argument that I have set up against you. And do you know that God did just that? You know, it's it's human nature and our pride to say, you know what, I know what the Bible says, but here's what I believe. 
hey, here's what I'm going to think. Here's how I'm going to live. Because I, I'm, I'm going to set up this argument. Once we do that, now, now we are making ourselves, <laughs> if you will, victims to this lion that roars and roams looking for whom to devour. We have to allow the weapons of warfare, which are humility and surrender to demolish these arguments that we have set up. But not only these arguments that we have set up with, with philosophies that we, have, that, that we have created that stand against God, but we have to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. It's not just the lies that we believe about the universe and about God, but it's the lies we believe about ourselves and the lies that we believe about each other. And the lies that we believe about humanity and, and our life and what God says about us. And, and what we have to do is we have to say, you know what, I know God says that I am loved. When I don't feel loved, when I don't feel valued, when I don't feel valuable, I've got to take captive that thought because that's a lie from the enemy. And I've got to surrender myself to what, the, what God does say about me. When I believe that another human being uh, is beyond my forgiveness, is beyond my love, is beyond my care, then I have to take captive that thought. Uh, and I have to bring that in submission to what God says is true. You know, there are quite often times in my life that I look back on where I've become discouraged. And, and in my discouragement, I have started believing a lie. Every time, I, every time I get into a place of discouragement, I believe a lie. And what I have to do is I have to identify that lie. And I have to take captive that thought and bring it in obedience to Christ. And bring it in obedience to what He says is true. So how are you doing when it comes to this? How are you doing when it comes to forgiving? How are you doing when it comes to surrendering to God's truth? Thirdly, the third thing that makes us spiritually weak, sick, and alone is lack of obedience. It's where we just don't surrender and we don't live a life obedient to God. Listen to what James says in James chapter 4, verse 7. He says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, the word submit is a military word. And, and what it means is literally get in your proper rank. So, so, for example, if you're in the army and you're a private, you're going to get in your proper rank and, and you're, you're going to stand at attention before a general. And you are going to obey, if a, well, even a sergeant or someone higher rank than you says anything. Uh, here's the problem. When we don't submit ourselves, we put ourselves out of proper rank and we end up being the general and we try to make God our private. And we say, God, I'm calling the shots. Here's what I want you to do. And God says, no, here's what you need to do. I call the shots. It's about my will and my kingdom. Here's how I want you to pray. And here's how I want you to live. And as I call the shots, I want you to obey. And this is what he's asking us to do. Submitting ourselves then to God. Now, the word submit is an active word. The word resist is a passive word in Greek. So as I submit myself to God and put myself in proper rank, and the word resist means I will then stand in proper rank. I will, as I submit myself to God, I will, by doing that, be resisting the devil. And when I resist the devil, he will flee. So when I stand in proper rank, when I live in proper rank, when I understand that it's about his will and his kingdom, the devil will be something, the, the, the devil will actually flee from me. The devil won't have a foothold in my life. And, and this is how we live out that prayer. Lead us not into temptation. Don't let us yield to it, but deliver us, rescue us from the evil one. So let me just recap. Our battle is lifelong. This is why we need the prayer. Our enemy is unseen. Our weaknesses are exploited. And number four, my victory, <laughs> my victory is guaranteed. You know, I love this part because the truth is, is that we can win the victory, but it's not our power. And we have to understand that. It's not our, it's not our fighting that wins the victory. It's our arming ourselves with the full armor of God. And that armor is all defensive, by the way, except for prayer and scripture. And so these are the offensive weapons that we have as we say no to temptation and say no to giving in and say no to giving up. So our victory is guaranteed.
You know, we're never above temptation. Every one of us is just one bad decision away from giving in or giving up. That's why we need to pray this prayer daily. Don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And as we pray this prayer daily, understand this, Jesus is there to help. He understands, and he's there to help us. Listen to what we're told in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. It says this, because he himself, speaking of Jesus, suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Who's being tempted? Well, we are on a daily basis. The temptation to give in or to give up. What's this telling us? He's been there. He's, he understands. He knows what we're going through. He knows the urges that we have to give in to temptation. He knows the urges that we have ultimately to give up. When we receive Jesus into our lives, he puts his spirit in us. And his spirit gives us the power to overcome and to live this victorious life that he's called us to live. But we cannot live it without the spirit. We have to trust in the Holy Spirit, surrender to him so that he can empower us to overcome these things that we face. Here's why Paul says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Live by the Spirit. Grow in the Spirit of God. Trust in the Holy Spirit of God. Surrender to the Holy Spirit, and He will produce fruit in you. Uh, read on in Galatians. He not only will do that, but He will empower you to live the life that Christ is calling us to live. So let me just summarize all this. Are you giving in to temptations in your life? Are you justifying them, saying things like, well, I'm tired, I'm bored, I'm lonely, I, I deserve this, just one time won't hurt? Uh, you know, are, are you doing that? Know that these temptations are traps of the evil one, and they ensnare us, and they enslave us. And the second question I want to end with is this, are you giving up? Is there anything in your life causing you to say something like this? I'm tired. I'm done. I've had enough. I'm walking away from this marriage. I'm walking away from my family. I'm walking away from something God's called me to do. I, I'm, I, I'm, I've had it. I've tried. I've prayed. I've waited on God long enough, and he hasn't come through in the way that I've wanted to, him to come through. And so I'm, I'm just giving up. Both of those are traps of the enemy, giving in and giving up. God wants to empower us so that we won't yield to these temptations and so that we won't be ensnared and trapped by the evil one. And what we learn, and what we learn in fact in the book of James is this, that as we face into these temptations and grow in perseverance, that that's in fact when we mature in the faith. And this is what God is calling us to. So I'm going to end by asking you, do you need to pray this prayer? Do, do, do you need to entrust your situation, your life to God's hands and just say, you know, I give it to you, Father. I, I not only need to know you and worship you and, and seek your kingdom, but, but I need you to daily provide for me. Uh, I need your forgiveness so that I can forgive others. Uh, I need you because I will yield to temptation without you. I want to end by having us all pray together the Lord's Prayer. And I'm just going to re recite it out of the King James, or New King James Version, as, as perhaps many of you know it. And just where you are, would you pray it with me as we close together? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And let's end with this, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.